Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we are taking a look at Michael Sandel's The Case Against Perfection uh, in association with Gattaca and Elysium, looking at this topic of genetic enhancement or genetic engineering in humans. So what we're gonna see out of Sandel is really a case um, against the use of genetic enhancement in humans, though potentially not for the reasons you might anticipate. So Sandel himself uh, is a professor at Harvard University, professor of government. Uh, he's worked on moral and, and political issues. Uh, he's got a very famous course called Justice that he teaches, which is actually available freely online. Uh, and it's been viewed by, or, you know, taken by, I think, millions of people at this point. Um, something worth checking out if you think it's interesting. Now, what we're looking at here is actually uh, an article he wrote that um, served as the basis for one of those books that he has. And of course, he also has other articles as well. Uh, so, very well known figure. Uh, and, and this piece came out 2004, so somewhat recently, um, not too terribly long after the film came out. And of course, the, the technical side of genetic enhancement has been advancing since then, but I think the case Sandel makes is just as relevant as ever. And the next video that I'll put up um, tomorrow, th Thursday, uh, we're going to take a look at a case in favor of the use of um, genetic engineering, genetic modification, uh, another, another way of referring to basically the same thing. Um, so we'll see that then. Now, something we are going to see here in Sandel's piece is that he is going to consider some different particular kinds of enhancements. So enhancements to muscles, memory, height. Uh, he's also going to look at genetic sex selection. And he's going to actually consider and reject some common objections to intentional genetic modification. So he thinks that some of the objections that are um, can potentially be offered against the use of genetic modification, in fact, don't really work the way that people might think they do. So then instead, he's going to offer what he thinks is really the, the best objection to genetic modification, which is what he calls hyperagency, the, the desire to, in effect, control nature. So with that, let's just jump in and get to it. So, uh, when thinking about this issue, Sandel says that, um, you know, we're, we're just thinking about genetic engineering or genetic modification or enhancement um, in general, one immediate reaction can be that that's a bad thing due to concerns about autonomy, fairness, and individual rights. Now, Sandel distinguishes here between older uh, state-sponsored, effectively eugenics programs that coercively try to breed a certain type of human and eliminate others. Uh, and he says, okay, so we can think about that, right? So you can look at, um, you know, probably most famous example of this kind of thing would be, or you know, infamous, I suppose, would be the Nazi breeding program and attempt to create a pure Aryan race. And of course, yeah, you know, it's quite well known about their attempts to eliminate what they considered to be um, racially, and we can conceive of that along genetic lines, genetically inferior groups, right, coercively right, and directly. Now, of course, that's probably the, the single most infamous example of this kind of program, uh, but there were many other sorts of programs in all sorts of other countries, including, uh, you know, Western, presumably liberal societies. So, of course, we can look at Canada. We're not innocent in this. Uh, United States, Britain. Uh, <laughs> Just about any um, you know liberal Western country has has had some kind of version of this. Now I'm I'm not going to stake my reputation on that. I don't know the full history of these programs, but we could look at um, there are certainly programs that were aimed to 
limit the reproductive capability of, of people with disabilities in Western countries. We might also look at programs designed to encourage, say, uh, you know, European settler populations and uh, reduce, minimize, in some cases, potentially even eliminate indigenous populations. Now, whether or not that was really part of a eugenics program, some people might want to debate, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get fully into that here. I think at least to some degree we can consider some of those approaches to be versions of eugenic programs, right? Trying to encourage the, uh, the, the breeding and, and the growth of certain population groups at the expense of, of others. Um, and so Sandel says, okay, so we can take all of those programs that try to coercively, you know, eliminate certain groups either directly or, you know, by killing them or indirectly by limiting their ability to, you know, successfully produce offspring and, and grow their population and so on um, through whatever means. So we can take those and he says, okay, those are problematic because of the the problems there that come up with rights and, and autonomy, free choice, fairness, right? There are all these serious problematic issues that are in some sense, at least to us now, certainly should be quite obviously, um, you know, salient here. So Sandel says, okay, so let's stick those aside. Those programs aren't any good. So, you know, if what we're talking about is some sort of forcible attempt to genetically modify the population. Sandel says, okay, that's no good, problematic, right? But let's shove that off, let's not talk about that. The more interesting and difficult case to deal with is actually contemporary and, and really future free market um, uh, genetic enhancement techniques. And I just altered the slide because I realized I, I made this, um, uh, omission, which I actually just went back and fixed it again because I made a mistake and tried to fix my mistake. Um, I've introduced an acronym here, IGM, for intentional genetic modification. And so we're going to see in the next piece we look at uh, by Powell and Buchanan, they use this distinction between intentional genetic modification, that is doing uh, what we we're talking about in the, in the previous video, having, say, scientists, technicians, uh, you know, trying to intentionally manipulate genetic material and say, okay, yeah, we want, you know, think about what's going on and say Gattaca, oh, we want this kind of hair color and we, you know, we don't want that, we do want this. And, right, picking and choosing what parts of the genetic material are going to be there and, and trying to manipulate genetics to our desires. Now, what Sandel's really talking about here is this intentional genetic modification where humans are going out of their way to try to manipulate genetic material to get the desired results. Um, Powell and Buchanan will also talk about unintentional gene genetic modification, which is just what happens through the you know natural processes of reproduction, right? Um, when people have children, they are producing modified genetic material, genetic material that was already there, but results from right, bringing together genetic material from um, you know two individuals, and it's unintentional in that sense because although you know, the production of a child of, of new genetic material might certainly be intended, uh, exactly how that genetic material turns out is in some sense randomized, right? You don't get to fully pick, you know, say the hair color of your child or whether they're gonna be particularly tall or not. Um, though to some degree we are making decisions along those lines, which is something Paul McCann are gonna talk about. So what Sandel's really interested in looking at here are free market genetic modification techniques, right? What if it's not some kind of state-sponsored eugenics program, but instead it's a, a commercial enterprise, right? There are companies that offer these services and you could use them or not use them. You can choose which one to use. You can choose to what extent you wanna use them. And really that's what's going on in Gattaca. And if you look at, you know, especially that first 20 minutes of Gattaca where, you know, Vincent is giving us an explanation of what the near future is like, um, people aren't forced to engage in genetic modification of their children, that genetic selection. But of course, even though it's, you know, you're free not to, society has really split. There's a, a you know, 
superior class of people who are genetically modified and there's an inferior class of people who aren't. And the people who aren't genetically modified, who haven't had that kind of selection and so on, are discriminated against in various sorts of ways. So, um, one brief uh, note just on this, that it could be objected that by, um, um, you know, designing children through the use of, of some of these genetic techniques might in some sense limit their autonomy. Uh, Sandell thinks even that objection isn't going to be very good because as it is, children, well, people, right, you and me and really anyone doesn't get to choose what their genetics are ahead of time, right? We're, we're just kind of stuck with them. We're, we're born with them. Um, which is this point here, sorry. Okay, so Sandel wants to look at particular cases of enhancement. So some particular kinds of enhancement and think about the objections that apply to that. So he thinks, you know, this, this autonomy objection doesn't really work to start with. So now he wants to look at particular cases of enhancement and what sorts of objections could be raised against them. In particular, fairness objections. So first, um, we can look at muscle enhancement, right? Uh, so uh, Sandell draws another distinction that I think is worth introducing here just before actually looking at this point that I brought up, that we can look at genetic modification as a way of trying to uh, treat diseases and uh, health issues that somehow limit natural capacities or, or reduce them, right? So um, although people might be born with various genetic dispositions to say growing muscles or, or whatnot, we do have certain conditions that we diagnose that you know, target muscles in a certain sort of way, you know, muscular dystrophy, for instance. And so Sandel wants to draw a bit of a distinction between treating and trying to eliminate those uh, negative conditions versus enhancing capacities, taking them above and beyond what is now uh, typical of um, people without those sorts of conditions. So thinking about, say, muscle enhancements, right? If we have the techniques to alter uh, the, the rate at which muscle is grown and, and you know, how much muscle individuals might be able to have as some kind of absolute limit, we can easily think about sports, right? Instead of trying to use steroids and whatnot, uh, if athletes instead are just genetically enhanced to start with, they won't necessarily have to use steroids or something, but they're going to be you know, stronger, faster, et cetera, uh, than people who aren't enhanced in that kind of way. So we might object that there's going to be an unfair advantage to the um, enhanced athletes over the unenhanced athletes. But Sandel thinks that that fairness objection doesn't really work because there's already differences in genetic endowments between athletes and we don't draw on the difference in those endowments and then say, oh, well, it's unfair that this athlete who has uh, you know, better genetic predisposition to growing muscle is now faster than that athlete who doesn't because they have more muscles. Uh, we don't do that, right? So he doesn't think this kind of fairness objection is really going to work once we introduce intentional genetic enhancement to say something like muscles. Similarly with uh, memory loss. So there are conditions that affect memory, right? Various forms of dementia and so on. Uh, and so we presumably can develop uh, um, genetic therapies, right? Or, or you know, do things like genetic selection, genetic modification in some sense, to try to treat and, and prevent those sorts of conditions. But then we could also enhance cognitive abilities, uh, presumably through the same sorts of processes. So just try to increase the cognitive abilities of, of people who weren't going to be suffering one of these conditions to start with. So here again, we can have a fairness objection raised, right? Over time, humanity is gonna split into two classes. There's gonna be the enhanced and the unenhanced. But Sandell thinks this doesn't really work as a, a, an objection to the enhancement itself either, 
Instead, it's an objection to uh, unequal access. So when we look at Gattaca and there's, you know, sort of the two categories of people, well, if everybody had been enhanced in the first place, then there wouldn't be that, that distinction between them. But of course, something I want to raise here, and then I'll, I'll put it to you more as a, a question than really as a statement. Sandel himself is saying, okay, what we're talking about are free market versions of genetic enhancement this way, right, or, or genetic modification. We're not talking about a state-sponsored program that forces people to do it. So if that's what we're talking about, if we're talking about something that remains a choice, then it does seem likely that, you know, in any future kind of scenario, you're going to have people like Vincent who aren't enhanced, right? Even if most people wind up being enhanced, it doesn't seem like everybody's going to be enhanced. So that might threaten Sandel's response here in saying this is really an access issue because even if, uh, you know, access to this kind of genetic screening or genetic enhancement was universal, right? Even if everybody had access to it, it's not the case that everybody would necessarily make use of it, which could then produce that uh, distinction between classes, which may or may not be problematic. Right? So now the other one that he looks at here is height enhancement. And now there might be a kind of arms race, right? If we think about um, advantages to, to height, and I'm not trying to here discriminate against anybody who doesn't consider themselves to be tall, um, but people might want to be tall for, you know, sports purposes or something, right? The taller you are in particular sorts of sports, uh, that confers a kind of advantage. There also might be other reasons to try to um, pursue additional height, right? You know, um, there are, th there's some evidence that uh, taller people tend to get certain sorts of benefits. I'm, I'm kind of tall-ish. I'm not, you know, massive, but I'm, I'm you know, not short. Um, don't always fit into spaces very well, but, you know, it could reach, things on top shelves and so on. I know that's not very interesting, but there are, I believe, and, and don't quite take my word for this, um, I'm sort of stretching back in my memory banks a little bit, but I'm fairly certain I've, I've heard about some evidence that taller people uh, tend to be promoted more, they are perceived in certain ways, perceived to be better in, in certain sorts of ways. It's not saying they are, it's, it's a perception issue. Um, so if height enhancement is a possibility, there might be a kind of arms race where people want to be, you know, have their, their children be above average height. And so of course, over time, that's going to increase the average height. And then that's going to leave behind the, the people who don't want to or can't afford to enhance and, and be tall. So here again, we could raise a, a fairness objection. You know, it's not fair if some people get to, uh, intentionally make their, their children taller or potentially make themselves taller, depending on what kind of technology we have, uh, if other people can't do it. But here again, Sandel says, if, if really what we have is a fairness objection, we could try to respond to that by publicly subsidizing height enhancement, right? If we give everybody equal access to it, then it's only people who intentionally choose not to uh, make use of it, who are going to be left behind in this sense, but that's not problematic if they're choosing to be left behind in that sense. Now, he also takes a look at the issue of sex selection, right? So choosing what sex the fetus or, or you know, child, however we want to phrase it, is going to be, right? Is it going to be male, female, perhaps uh, something else? But he thinks this really just poses a kind of technical problem. So I mentioned this with, uh, in the video yesterday with, with Gattaca, near the outset, what we really see with Vincent's parents when they're selecting their, their second child, Anton, uh, is that the, the engineer has already sort of selected down from a whole bunch of different potential candidates to like two, two boys and two girls, two male, two female. Uh, and then it's up to them to pick, you know, okay, well, which, which one do you want? And then they just sort of dispose of the other um, you know, fertilized eggs or, or embryos. So that, you know, could be potentially problematic depending on how we view 
the moral status of those embryos. But it seems entirely possible, at least Sandel thinks, that there could be uh, selection techniques that allow the sperm to be selected um, before the embryo is created in determining what, you know, what, what the, the result is going to be, whether or not it's going to be uh, male or female. So we could object to sex selection on the ground of fetal rights, you know, intentionally terminating the, the life, right, or, or whatever exactly we want to call it of a, an embryo or a fetus because of its sex it may certainly be morally problematic. But Sandel says, well, just imagine that we develop the technology where we can just select sperm, right? Only the sperm that are going to produce the embryo of the sex that we want. So we're not producing a whole bunch of them and eliminating them, but instead we, we just get to choose ahead of time whether or not we want like male or female or whatnot. And I think we can extend this to everything that's going on in Gattaca. If we have sufficient technological capability, presumably we could select the sperm ahead of time that was going to be used in fertilizing the egg to get the results we want. So you wouldn't have to produce, say, a dozen embryos or, or even more, and then go through picking the one with the best genetic material. Instead, you could pick ahead of time what's going to wind up producing the best genetic material and then only bringing that together. Right, to, to create the embryos you want. So Sandel thinks, just summing up what we've looked at here, that the typical objections to genetic modification don't really stand up to scrutiny when we're thinking about um, genetic modification within a, a you know, liberal society in a, a freeish market where people get to choose whether or not they want to genetically enhance their children, or potentially themselves, depending on exactly you know, how this might work in the future. Objections based on autonomy, those are sensible when it's a coercive program, trying to force people to uh, breed in certain sorts of ways or right, trying to adjust the population in certain sorts of ways. Objections based on autonomy certainly apply there, but not in free liberal societies. So in those societies, instead, we have to think about other sorts of objections. So one might be the autonomy objection, you know, uh, choosing the genetic material the children have makes it not their choice, but Sandel says it's already not their choice anyway, so that it doesn't seem like there's anything, there's any new problem there if we're intentionally modifying genetics. So what we're left with seem to be fairness objections, but in all of these various cases, uh, you know, with the, the different kinds of enhancement, he says, really, we can get around the fairness objection by making sure that everybody has access to modification, or the fairness objection, again, isn't producing anything new, right? Athletes already have an un uneven playing field, so to speak, uh, because they have different genetic endowments already. So you know, there's no new problem really being introduced. And if we make sure everybody has the right access, there's nothing being, uh, you know, no new problem there. Uh, and then when we come to something like sex selection, that might also seem problematic, right, on something like the fetal rights grounds. But he says there are ways of getting around this as well. So if we think there is some kind of problem inherent in genetic modification, it has to be something other than these concerns of fetal rights or fairness. So what might that be? And that's exactly what Sandel is trying to put his finger on and his proposal is really that it's the attitudes and dispositions that prompt the drive for enhancement that pose the problem. So it's not genetic enhancement itself that's problematic. Rather, it's the desire for enhancement that's problematic. And, and those kinds of attitudes that are going to be encouraged by allowing genetic enhancement or genetic modification to occur. And this, again, I think Gattaca does a, a pretty nice job in capturing, where you have that stratified society, right? There's, there's sort of the, the overclass and the underclass, uh, and there are differences in the attitudes between them, how they treat each other, the sorts of opportunities that are open to them. Uh, it, and, and there are several scenes in the film that, that speak to this, and I'll just sort of leave it to you to, to mull that over, especially if you've watched it already or, or you're going to watch it yet. Yeah. So it's these attitudes and dispositions that are really problematic. And he thinks 
this is something similar both in thinking about genetic modification as well as sex selection as well. So thinking about sex selection, wanting a child of, of one sex or the other, it's not necessarily the technique being used, right? Why do I put necessarily there in, in brackets? Well, again, depending on how we think about the moral status of an embryo, um, right? If we develop those techniques that make it so that we're not producing embryos and then destroying them in an effort to um, get the, the uh, child of, of the sex that we want, but instead we're only bringing together the you know, sperm and egg that are going to produce the child in the first place. If, if it's just the technique, we might be able to work around that. But Sandel thinks it's not just the technique that's the issue, but it's really it's the desire to favor one sex over the other that is really the problematic element in the first place. Similarly, when we're thinking about muscle memory and height enhancements, right? Not just trying to treat illnesses and disease, but go beyond our natural capacities, right? It's that desire to manipulate ourselves and to improve ourselves in this sense, to be better than ordinary, uh, to be better than human in some sense. It's, it's that, right? It's, it's that desire itself that is really where the problem lies. So the way Sandel puts this is that the drive to intentional genetic modification represents a kind of hyperagency, a kind of Promethean aspiration to remake nature, including human nature, to serve our purposes and satisfy our desires. Uh, and if you're unfamiliar with Promethean, uh, that's being used here as a, an adjective, derives from Prometheus, uh, Greek god or sort of Greek mythological figure associated with um, creation and, and crafting, right? Was um, tasked by the gods in creating humans in a certain sort of way, depending on, on exactly how the myth goes. So as Sandel puts it, he says, the problem is not the drift to mechanism, right? It's, it's not that we're moving away from natural reproduction to using these mechanical scientific techniques. So it's, it's, the problem is not the drift to mechanism, but the drive to mastery. And what the drive to mastery misses and may even destroy is an appreciation of the gifted character of human powers and achievements. To acknowledge the giftedness of life is to recognize that our talents and powers are not wholly our own doing, despite the effort we expend to develop and exercise them. It is also to recognize that not everything in the world is open to whatever use we may desire or devise. Appreciating the gifted quality of life constrains the Promethean project and conduces to a certain humility. It is in part a religious sensibility, but its resonance reaches beyond religion. So it's about being open in some sense to what's beyond our control, right? In appreciating the giftedness of life, really what's, what's going on there, what Sandel is talking about, is uh, being open to accepting things the way they are, at least to some extent, and to not be gripped by the, the desire to you know, remake everything the way we want it, to allow that some things properly shouldn't be under our control, even if they could be under our control. In trying to uh, elaborate on this and make sense of this, Sandel draws on uh, William F. May's distinction between accepting and transforming love of children. The way Sandel explains, he says, accepting love affirms the being of the child, whereas transforming love seeks the well-being of the child. Each aspect corrects the excesses of the other. So accepting love is really accepting the child as is. And, and I think, you know, he's talking about this, you know, in children, or parents loving their children, but I think we can do this in, um, we, we can think about this with love just in general as well. We can think about it, I think, between you know, parents to their children. We can also think about it, children to their parents. We can think about it uh, in romantic love. I think we can think about it you know, within a family, among siblings and so on. Accepting love is really accepting someone for who they are, right? It's, it's just um, loving them because they're them. Transforming love is there to try to 
you know, maximize somebody's uh, uh, potential, right? Help them realize their potential. Help them to be the best version of themselves they can be, right? That transforming love, it's really to drive them to be the best. So when we think about, we'll just go back to this, this context of parents loving children. You know, on one hand, we uh, sort of expect parents to love their children no matter what, right? But we also have an expectation that parents are going to try to help their children be the best they can be, right? They're not, even though they should love them no matter what, they should encourage them to be the best version of this, themselves they can be and not just totally shrug and say, well, I love you no matter what you do, so I don't care if you do anything at all. Now, there can be a, a lack of balance here. So if there's too much transforming love, right, at the risk uh, or at the expense of accepting love, what we get is, is hyper-parenting, um, a kind of parenting that is striving really solely to make the child that best version of themselves there can be at the sacrifice of accepting love. So the love itself seems to become conditional on the child achieving certain things, right? We can think about parenting in this fashion as sort of a, a checklist, right? Well, you know, you have to uh, do well in, you know, grade school and you have to go do well in university and then you're going to become a lawyer and then you're going to become a judge and then you're going to become a you know, politician, they're going to be the prime minister, or whatever, you know, and if you don't do that, well, you're just terrible. I'm not going to love you. And, you know, maybe that last part's not said, but that, that push, right, you have to do all these things uh, and you have to live your life in this particular sort of way. That's really too much transforming love, or at least too much, you know, if, if we think in fact, there's some kind of problem. There. On the other hand, too much accepting love without transforming love would be precisely what I was saying. Just you know, accepting the child for whatever they are and really not encouraging or, or um, helping them achieve what they could be, right? Uh, in some sense, not allowing them to realize their potential. Now, Sandal also points to sports where, uh, as another example, where we think a kind of balance needs to be maintained. Um, now, I've stuck all in, in with a question mark there. Um, Sandel says this, and I'll, I'll come back to my remark in a moment. So we care about excellence in sports, right? Uh, we don't just care about effort, right? It's not just about how hard people try, but we also care about the achievement, right? We care about people actually, you know, winning the Stanley Cup or whatever, um, World Series, other sport things, Super Bowl, there's one. I, I don't know sports very well. Um, Right? We, we care about who wins, right? but we also care about the effort that's involved. If people won without actually putting forth the effort, I think we'd be pretty disappointed. But we also don't just care about the effort without the winning. Right? It's precisely you know, the, the balance that's struck here. We care about both of those things. So we care about things like steroid use, drug enhancement in sports, as well as genetic enhancement, right? that that could pose this kind of problem. It, it would you know, affect the balance going on, right? Why do we care about that? Well, Sandel thinks it can't just be due to simple fairness, right? As noted earlier, athletes have different genetic endowments, so the playing isn't fair to begin with. Sandel instead suggests that the real problem with genetically altered athletes is that the corrupt athletic competition is a human activity that honors the cultivation and display of natural talents. From this standpoint, enhancement can be seen as the ultimate expression of the ethic of effort and willfulness a kind of high-tech striving. So if we did just allow for genetically enhanced athletes, or say athletes you know, using steroids and, and any means they possibly could to increase their performance, right? It might be technological, it might be um, you know, steroids, you know, sort of metabolic aspects, could be genetic enhancement and so on. That really affects the, the balance in a certain sort of way and changes what's going on from this activity that, as he says, honors the cultivation and display of natural talents into something else, into this kind of high-tech striving, as he puts it. Now, the way Sandel talks about this, he certainly seems to generalize and, and you know, really seems to be implying us, you know, we all feel this way. Now, I don't know about you, and again, not a big sports person, so maybe that should speak against my attitude here. Uh, I, for one, would be interested in seeing both a, I don't, the natural league, right, 
uh, where people are not enhanced, they're not on steroids, they're not genetically enhanced, and so on. And then the, I don't know, the enhanced league, right? Where pretty much anything goes. You can use steroids, you can be genetically enhanced, you can have, I don't know, cybernetic implants or whatever. Um, there certainly does seem to be a, an issue there, and I think it might be a fairness issue, but maybe, maybe that's not quite right between allowing a completely enhanced athlete compete against a completely, you know, natural, unenhanced athlete, uh, that does seem to introduce a kind of, of unevenness or unfairness that makes that sort of competition unappealing. Probably a better word there. Uh, but for the people who are, are willing and, and able to, you know, do anything, like take steroids, be genetically enhanced, use technology and so on to try to maximize their performance I for one just as a spectator would be potentially interested in seeing that right as a kind of other league or, or an alternative format now I think there's also an interesting question here if we're doing this within the context of a, a free you know liberal society where people get to pick and choose uh, you know where they want to spend their money what they want to give their time to I would be interested to see what the free market would reward more if there were, say, natural and enhanced leagues in different sports, I, I honestly don't know, but I'd be uh, very intrigued to see which, which version of different sports would get more views, more money, more engagement from uh, the population in general. Right? And, and quite honestly, I don't know. And I, I don't have any data to support anything here. Um, Sandell might be right that, in fact, the vast majority of people are, are only interested in the sort of natural version. I'm not sure. But I, for one, would at least be interested in, in sort of seeing the experiment conducted based on people's choices, not experimenting on them without their consent in some sort of coercive fashion. Just want to make sure that's clear. Okay. So it's this, this Promethean aspiration to remake nature. Right? It's this hyper-agency. So if we think about agency as a kind of control over our, our actions and our environment, right? hyper-agency is really taking that to an extreme. And it's really in hyper-agency that Sandell thinks that the problem lies. It's that attitude, it's that desire that's the problem. And genetic modification, intentional you know, genetic enhancement, is really a manifestation of that. And that's really where the problem is. The reason it's problematic to uh, indulge in and perhaps encourage hyperagency is that it really threatens to alter um, some of our other our, our, you know, senses of um, certain key components of, of who we are and how we treat each other, including humility, responsibility, and solidarity. Sandell thinks if we go down the road of Gattaca or say Elysium as well, and I think this. Uh, what we're talking about here, the, the threats of hyperagency, you do see this, I think, certainly in Elysium, at least to some degree, uh, is that our moral landscape is going to change in ways that Sandell thinks would be problematic. So we stand to lose our sense of humility, right? Our, our recognition that we are not in complete control of ourselves or the world that we live in. Uh, we will lose our sense of giftedness, that we should regard certain benefits that we receive, both in our genetic endowments, our, our upbringing, the environment we live in, uh, as in some sense gifts as things to be appreciated and cherished. Right? Um, now, Sandell certainly does think we should fight against illness and disease, so he has absolutely no problem using genetic technologies to help fight against, you know, things like Alzheimer's or muscular dystrophy or, right, any other sort of condition we can put our, our finger on and say, this poses some kind of, of problem to the, um, the flourishing of our natural capacities, right? So Sandel's against enhancement, going beyond what we're sort of naturally given or, or uh, what, you know, tends to occur in, in humans in that unintentional manner. But he doesn't think we should be enhancing ourselves. Why? Precisely because we lose these uh, uh, attitudes. Now, in talking about 
Humility, he says, in a social world that prizes mastery and control, parenthood is a school for humility. And, and he's talking about the social world as it already is. We can't choose what our children will be like, so we have to accept them as they come, you know, at least in some regards, like their basic genetic endowments, while still striving to transform them in a positive fashion, striking that right balance between accepting and transforming love. As he says, to appreciate children as gifts or blessings is not, of course, to be passive in the face of illness or disease. Medical intervention to cure or prevent illness uh, or restore the injured to health does not decrease nature but honors it. Healing sickness or injury does not override a child's natural capacities but permits them to flourish. Now, I just want to pause there for a second and note that something Sandel is doing that we're going to see Powell and Buchanan really call into question is in some sense putting on a pedestal what our natural or average, right, the typical human capacities as they currently exist. He's taking those and sort of marking those out as somehow special or um, you know, uh, uh, morally acceptable. So we are, there, there's no problem, Sandel thinks, in trying to make sure nobody is uh, you know, somehow inhibited or um, um, prevented from having their natural capacities, that is capacities within the sort of average range of typical functioning without some sort of um, problematic condition interfering, right? That's okay, right? That is honoring nature. Even though those different sorts of conditions, right? Alzheimer's or, or cancers or muscular problems or whatever, those are natural in the sense of naturally occurring. It's not like supervillains go running around producing diseases and illness in people. So Sandell thinks that on the one hand, it is morally acceptable to try to reject parts of nature, but it's morally problematic to try to reject other parts. That is rejecting what is typical or average for us now by trying to overcome that and enhance what we offer. Right? That he says that's no good. Right? You, you can't go beyond what nature does in that sense, right? and pushing the average up. But it's, it's quite fine to try to get rid of those, what we consider to be problematic um, components of it. So there's an interesting question there about whether or not that distinction really stands up to scrutiny. And we'll take a look in Powell and Buchanan, and we'll see that crop up there at least to some degree. Now, in losing our sense of humility and, and giftedness, right, losing uh, this appreciation for what's outside of our control. Sandell thinks that the result there is that our sense of, of individual responsibility is going to increase, and that is going to undermine our sense of communal solidarity with one another. And this, again, is something I think we see in Gattaca in interesting ways. And Sandell draws attention to, say, insurance schemes here. So the more that comes into our control, right, think about, say, uh, genetic endowments, right, our range of responsibility is going to become wider. No longer will a poor genetic endowment be seen as an unfortunate fact of nature, but instead will be seen as the failings of a parent. Again, we see this in, in Gattaca, right? Um, parents really now being shouldered with the responsibility of choosing what the genetic disposition of their, their child is going to be like. And if they don't do that, right, if they have a child like Vincent who is not, um, you know, genetically modified or, or selected for in certain ways. Or with Anton, where the, his parents want to leave something up to chance, right? They, they, they sort of um, push back a little bit when choosing Anton with that, that engineer or tech who's sort of saying, okay, you know, I selected down to uh, write these, these few specimens. So it's really just a choice here. And they said, well, shouldn't we leave some things up to chance? He says, well, why would you want to do that, right? Like, why would you make the choice to potentially have your child disadvantaged in those sorts of ways, right? Why would you make that choice? You're responsible for how that child turns out because you could choose otherwise. Right? So there's going to be more and more individual responsibility for things like genetic endowment. So if we have the widespread ability to make these sorts of choices, say having a child that has some sort of uh, you know, disability or impairment, However we define those, because I think there's an interesting question about how we define these sorts of things. Um, all of a sudden, that becomes the result of a choice of the parents, 
right? It's not just something that happens to people in our community and we can't all control it. And it's exactly that shift that changes our sense of solidarity and starts to undermine it. When one's issues are not unfortunate events that may befall anybody and remain outside of our control, but are instead regarded as preventable occurrences that have been allowed to happen through negligence, part of the basic moral fabric of society will be eroded even further than it already has been. This is where insurance schemes come in. So insurance schemes are entered into by people who realize that the world escapes their control, right? They, and of course, some of these are mandated, right? You know, if you drive a vehicle around, the government tells you you have to have insurance of a certain sort. There are other sorts of insurance you don't have to have, right? Depending on your, your situation, your assets and so on, you might have life insurance or insurance uh, in case you get disabled or um, right, that you pick up some sort of a disability somehow, or you know, there's some kind of accident, or right, there are all kinds of different insurance you can get. Right now, in choosing to get insurance, we pool our assets together out of potential self interest, but in the long run, really what happens is that the people who are more fortunate and who don't actually befall those, those bad things end up subsidizing the cost of the less fortunate. But once we can reliably separate the more fortunate from the less fortunate and see the less fortunate as responsible for their own situation, you know, through their own choices or the choices of people who should have been looking out for them. It seems likely that the groups will start separating more and more, with those more fortunate ceasing to assist those less fortunate. The end result, end result is an ultimate reinforcement of the myth of the self-made man. So we can see this in Gattaca, near the start of the film with, with young Vincent. Uh, there's a, a school of some sort that he's trying to get into his parents are trying to put him into and they're told that the insurance isn't going to cover it if he has a fall or something precisely because he's not um, doesn't have the right genetic endowment and so he's, he's not going to be covered in the same sort of way right so that that pooling um, there are now separate pools for the genetically enhanced and the genetically uh, unenhanced so we can see this in Elysium as well right the people up on Elysium sort of uh, separating themselves morally from the people on earth they now, you know, the people of Elysium see themselves as part of a, a group that needs to pool their assets to some degree for mutual protection and self-interest and so on, right? They have to make sure their environment is clean, the habitat is safe and secure and, right, self-sufficient and so on. But they've really got no interest in, in what's going on on Earth anymore, right? Um, so we, we see the, the similar sort of thing happening there. So Sandel, uh, closes really with with this and I figure this is a good way to, to close my remarks here it says there's something appealing even intoxicating about a vision of human freedom unfettered by the given right the given just like what's outside of our control it may even be the case that the allure of that vision play a part in summoning the genomic age into being it is often assumed that the powers of enhancement we now possess arose as an inadvertent byproduct of biomedical progress the genetic revolution came so to speak to cure disease and stayed to tempt us with the prospect of enhancing our performance, designing our children, and perfecting our nature. That may have the story backwards. It is more plausible to view genetic engineering as the ultimate expression of our resolve to see ourselves astride the world, the masters of our nature. But that promise of mastery is flawed. It threatens to banish our appreciation of life as a gift and to leave us with nothing to affirm or behold outside of our own will. All right, so I'll go ahead and end my remarks on Sandel there. That should give you a good sense of why he thinks allowing for the kind of genetic engineering or genetic enhancement or intentional genetic modification, all those I'm just trying to use synonymously here, uh, in the way that they're used, particularly in Gattaca, but also quite potentially in Elysium, assuming we allow for some of those, um, I think, relatively safe assumptions I was talking about in the previous video. Uh, about what's going on with the med bays and so on. These are the reasons that Sandell thinks that that sort of, of program is problematic. This is why we shouldn't allow for this kind of technology to be used in this sort of way. And we should um, either, you know, ethically choose collectively not to engage in it or even to produce laws to the effect of, of trying to ban them for enhancement purposes and restrict their use to uh, you know, therapeutic uses, trying to uh, 
cure diseases and, and prevent illnesses, but not to make ourselves better than we already are, or at least can be. Next video, I'm going to be taking a look at Powell and Buchanan's key, uh, piece, which is going to argue instead that we in fact should embrace the use of these sorts of technologies because um, in fact the, the sort of privileging Sandel gives to uh, our, our current sort of average or, or typical um, genetic endowments and our, our natures is really unjustified, they think. And we can have healthier, happier, longer lives uh, with better health. Well, I already said that with the healthy, right? Um, if in fact we start using these technologies to improve ourselves in these sorts of ways, despite the potential societal risk that might come along. So I'll be looking at that next day. And until then, I hope you're well. Thanks for watching. <laughs>